Oh, actually, it may have broken down on me. <laughs> womp womp. Ah, there we go. So hi, I'm Sean Porter. Uh, I work for a company called Sensu. I'm the author and CTO. Uh, I created Sensu five years ago, and I ended up finding my way to a company called Heavy Water Operations, uh, where we continue to build the product and uh, support it in people's organizations. Uh, my background's primarily in operations. Uh, that's where I get my opinions from. Um, uh, I've, I have experience uh, automating and monitoring infrastructure for small, fast-moving startups all the way to the Fortune 100. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of monitoring. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge where things have progressed from. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that modern day tools owe a lot to what happened in the 1980s. I'm going to talk about Sensu and its approach to monitoring and, and what it decided to steal from other things. Uh, and then the future, what it means for Sensu, for monitoring, for us as operation and development folks as things move forward and progress. So for the, for the evolution of monitoring, I'm going to use the idea of a timeline. Uh, it's going to frame the conversation and analysis of these tools. Again, it's important to think of, of these tools and when they were created and how they were changed over time to address issues as the technology itself evolved. So here's our timeline. It's very exciting, I know. Uh, so we're going to go back to 1983, all the way back. So of course, I wasn't around then. So I'm not a historian. Disclaimer, uh, this is based off Wikipedia. Uh, so I'm going to start with just ping, good old modest ping, right? We all have used it throughout our careers. Um, it's named after the sound that sonar makes. Uh, so of course, I had to put a yellow submarine on here. If, if you've noticed, I've hand drew these slides. So I'm sorry if they may seem a little childish, but I had a lot of fun doing them. Uh, <laughs> So ping is just a simple command, right? You, you run it, we take it for granted every day. You run it on your, your machine through a terminal that you're very comfortable with. It uses ICMP to send an echo packet to a network device, right? And you expect a response back. What's cool about ping is that it uses the standard open protocol, it talks over the net, and it can, it can figure a few things out. Not only can it say I was able to reach it or not, um, but it can also get you some telemetry data. A problem with ping, though, is that there are many actual implementations of the command, and they all have slightly different output formats. Another problem with ping is that it's just a command, right? It's just an, a simple base instrument that you run. Uh, there's no scheduling, so you have to use something else. But when you think of ping and ICMP, you know, this is kind of the basis to a lot of tools that we still use today. ICMP, though, is not a first-class citizen anymore. You know, you got quality of service. You got people just ignoring it. You know, it kind of breaks down, especially when things are very ephemeral and moving around. You can't actually know where something's supposed to be on a network. So fast forward five years. So we're going to 1988. <laughs> the not-so-simple network management protocol. Um, again, this is, this is a, a, a prolific open standard protocol that we still use, a lot of our tools. If you're in networking, this is probably how you're doing your stuff still to date. I'm sorry. Um, but the basis is that this is pretty cool in that it's essentially the very first largely adopted, agreed upon agent based monitoring system. So you run your agents on your devices, on your systems, and then you have a manager that communicates over the net to them. What's interesting about SNMP is that it uses uh, a spec around encapsulating for UDP packets for like octet strings, time ticks, integers. Uh, it sends those messages out and it expects the agent to respond to it in a certain way. What's cool about this uh, SNMP, too, is that it's really just variables, setting and getting variables. Uh, so you're getting either current status using a query or you're getting telemetry data, uh, which you eventually can do something with. What's also interesting about SNMP is the trap concept where essentially you're allowing any agent or software that understands SNMP to send unsolicited messages, um, which is interesting. But the problem with SNMP is that you have to either have tiered management to you know, do things at scale, figure things out, traverse networks. 
You also have to punch UDP holes everywhere. Um, also, security for SNMP is horrendous, right? It's a tire fire. You, you, got, you got three versions still used today, V1, V2C, and V3. Um, V1 and 2 uses a community string. It's all plain text. You're sending them over UDP payloads. Anyone can sniff that, read that, jump on, send you unsolicited messages. Great. <laughs> What's worse than a false positive? Well, a false positive generated by somebody else. Um, so, I mean, this is still, still 1988. It did evolve, and eventually this V3 that has supports encryption and proper authentication. Um, it's a stateless protocol, though, generally. Uh, so it's still a little clunky, and people are stuck on V2C uh, for the most part. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so, I mean, I really like the idea of SNMP messages, uh, uh, traps, those unsolicited, because it's essentially a very early push-based system. We're not just pulling something. We can just receive events as they occur. Um, the only thing is you, don't, you can't have any set expectations on them. Uh, but you can get them, but, you know, Admiral Akbar approves. Uh, so fast forward to 1999, the golden year for monitoring, open source monitoring. One thing, uh, I've only talked about open source tools. There's a ton of commercial ones in between, but these are the ones that I found, you know, really inspired me in, in, in writing software, particularly monitoring software. Um, so yeah, it's just... There's a few things, but I see the 1999 year is the golden year. So to start off that year, we got our RRD tool, right? This is visualization 101. When we're talking about SNMP and that telemetry data, well, for years and years, this is where it ended up. So it's essentially a round robin database uh, that has a set step or set interval that it expects data for a series. And that's set when the file is created. You cannot change it after the fact. Um, but what's cool about RRD is it's very simple. It has bindings for just about any language. Uh, so whether you're writing Python, Perl, Ruby, C, whatever, you can write to an RRD file and create a visualization tool. So what's great about RRD is it's fairly efficient. Um, it creates you a visualization. What sucks about it, it lacks any context beyond the base telemetry data, base time series, right? You have uh, a time and a value. Um, and then you're stuck to that time interval. If you don't send data, you end up with these big gaps, right? The question mark, what happened here? Did I fail to send data? Did RRD break? What's happening? Um, but because of this constraint, it also allows RRD to be more efficient. It allows it to do um, consolidation uh, using a, a, a different functions, whether it be average, min, or max, to essentially compress things over time. But again, a lot of tools still use this today, especially in the network space. Enough, funny enough, it seems the network space is caught back in like 1988. We got SNMP and RRD tools, and that's like the state, state of monitoring. So the next is OpenNMS. So I see OpenNMS as one of the first open source monitoring tools that was widely adopted that utilized these standard protocols, right? Like there's our ICMP, there's our ping, there's SNMP, Oh, God. And then you got TCP, uh, so it can just get arbitrary uh, events, which is pretty neat. And then syslog. So this is where they took a standard logging protocol and were able to scrape it and get some more context for alerts uh, and, and generate some interesting uh, events. And then it's able to notify people via email, XMPP, SMS, custom scripts, create JIRA tickets, all sorts of things. What I liked about OpenNMS, uh, other than that it started to just utilize more and more of these protocols, was that it was written in Java. Uh, and internally, it used a message bus architecture where internal services, parts of the service, were able to throw things onto this queue and asynchronously work through them. This allows OpenNMS from the beginning to date of dealing with a large amount of data, especially when you're talking about getting into the syslog and, and log monitoring game. That's, that's a lot of crap to, to suck up. And then it used Postgres eventually uh, as the back end. So this is kind of like the first time that I saw a tool that used an open source database to store its state. And I thought that was cool instead of you know, coming up with its own state file. So 1999, 
There's a pro project that not many people recognize. It's called NetSaint. Uh, they had trademark issues. What's funny about NetSaint is in the year 1999, and if you flip that over and drop off the one, <laughs> coincidence? I don't think so, because what it turned into, the old famous nachos, I mean nagios. So nagios is like the beast we all love to hate, right? We, we still use it in a lot. 60% of the community users that do uh, like uh, Big Panda's community polls are still using Nagios to date. What Nagios did was that it really had a centric view around hosts and services, right? You have hosts that fall within the confines of a, of a service. Um, and then it still supported SNMP, it supported uh, uh, TCP, ICMP, those standard things that OpenNMS did. Uh, but for me, what was really neat about Nagios was NRPE, or the Nagios Remote Plugin Executor. Uh, it was basically an agent you would run on your machines that Nagios could say, hey, I need some CPU, some uh, memory statistics, but I can also say, I want you to run this plugin to essentially check the health of this service. Um, so I, for me, Nagios, that's where, that's where its, its power came from, right? So I don't want to dwell on Nagios too much, but uh, it gets enough attention every night. Uh, it does have issues with scaling in today's or, um, architectures, uh, especially ones where we're using open like, clouds, we've got ephemeral resources. It uses a static configuration uh, config file where you have to define all your hosts and services ahead of time. So if you had an auto-scaling group, you're, you're out of luck. You have to use either something to bolt on to Nagios to do discovery and drive that configuration, or you have to change how you monitor those services with it. So this is what I see is the most value coming out of Nagios, right? Is the plugin spec that it used. Those plugins that NRPE was asked to execute are very simple. You have standard output, it's fine, it's on fire, it exploded. Uh, and you have an exit status to indicate severity, whether it be zero, for OK, one for warning, two for critical, three for unknown slash custom. Now you can use digits all the way up to I think 255, so you can assign your own custom severities or, or something to add more context. But what's really great about this plugin spec is it's extremely accessible, right? Anyone in your organization can write a script that outputs a standard out and an exit status code. There's nothing else. You can use any language. Um, which is really cool, and it's stu super flexible in that that standard out doesn't have to be just a string, right? That can be structured data. Nagios itself added its own as an afterthought, which was perf data, so, and then it didn't really do much with that data, but you can add even, this could be JSON output, this could be YAML, whatever, uh, and then you can do things with it, uh, although Nagios can't. Uh, so let's fast forward to all the way to 2008. So 1999 was the, the golden year for monitoring, as I put it, uh, where we got the, the Nagios. There was a, a big gap, and I mean, there's a bunch of honorable mentions in here. Like you got Xenos, Zabbix, a few others. Uh, I wasn't particularly a fan of these things. Um, they, they either pushed more features only into their enterprise products that were the only compelling thing for their platform. They tried to do everything, so it became these big, fat monoliths. Uh, and then you were tied to their configuration methods, and then they had to uh, evolve on that with like, things like templating to make, to make it bearable. Uh, I'm not a big fan. Of course, they're still around today. They're widely adopted, uh, especially in Europe. A lot of people really like their stuff. Um, but 2008 was kind of like where I saw the next jump. Uh, this Graphite was actually originally created in 2006, but wasn't released to the public until 2008. It was created at Orbitz. Um, what Graphite is a time series database. So we got from RRD from 99 to 2008, we have Graphite. What's cool about Graphite is that you can do a lot more with it. To me, the biggest thing about Graphite is the functions. Uh, of course, RRD eventually added some of these functions, but Graphite has a, a slew of them. So what you end up with with Graphite is a standard line protocol where you can have a metric name, where you can use dots or periods to create a hierarchy. You get a metric value, 
uh, which can be a, a float, integer, what have you, and then a epoch timestamp uh, to indicate when, when that event occurred or when that metric occurred. Uh, and then there's a, a few other protocols that accepts like pickle, but whatever. Uh, but the, what's cool about Graphite is you can have a number of different monitoring uh, agents send data over these, uh, uh, these protocols, uh, and then Graphite will store them. But what's really cool with these functions and its API, we can ask Graphite some interesting things. We're not just visualizing a time series uh, set like we are with RRD. We're able to say, hey, Graphite, give me the, the disk that has the most utilization with this, in this, this uh, metric key space, right? I want to know which node in my cluster has the most full disk that I can replace that sort of thing. I can also ask uh, things like, give me the derivative, so if for network interfaces and you only have bytes over time, which is pretty cool. What a lot of people really like about Graphite is its render API. Basically, if you hit this, it will render you an image of your, your, your graph. This is really cool, especially for embedding in other tools. Uh, you can put in chat rooms like your Slack or IRC. It's pretty handy. Now, at the top, I've men mentioned this thing called Holt Winters forecasting uh, or exponential smoothing. Uh, what this allows you to do with Graphite is you can say, I have this data that looks really like seasonal data. Uh, I want to know if I'm going to exceed that based on this. Am I going to go over disk utilization in six months so I can use it for capacity planning? Uh, or is something wrong? Like, did my orders just plummet on this Friday afternoon for whatever reason? Although orders is a terrible metric to use for whole winners. Um, and then as percent is a really cool one. So there's a ton of them. I really recommend checking out graphiteapp.org and just seeing what, what's available there. Uh, 1.0 is probably out this week. And there's a lot of tooling and making it a lot easier to get, get, get up and running. It's written in Python. Um, historically, it hasn't been too easy to set up. But once you set it up, it keeps working. So it's something I have to call out after mentioning forecasting and graphite. Right? These things, I feel, are the, the long troll for many of us that are trying to use these technologies because they're very interesting. You know, the promise of automatically detecting failures before they happened or you're about to run out of disks are these, these, these sort of questions that we want to be able to ask our computers and have them do the work for us. Um, and I mean, a lot of products and a lot of open source tools go after these as, as the goal. But I think in most, they can be a tool but I don't think they're a part of your alerting engine. I don't think you should be relying on these things to be waking people up at night. So CEP, or complex event processing, the idea is that you can take multiple data sources, crush them all together, inspect the stream uh, within a time window, essentially, uh, and see if you can create a correlation uh, between anything. So you can build up some more context and be able to essentially a uh, template or figure out a pattern that indicated that failure either before it happened or as it happened that your other monitoring tools may have missed. Um, forecasting, same like Holt winners is a simple uh, example where you essentially draw confidence bands of the range where the value should fall within for that time. And then anomaly detection is taking a data stream and being like, this looks weird, that looks funky. Um, but I mean, when you're talking about anomaly detection in today's infrastructure where we're changing things rapidly, we're adding services, we're deploying every hour instead of every month, uh, there's just too many factors at play that anomaly detection is like, actually, oh, you just deployed a new feature that added three seconds of latency, right? And I don't want to be alerted for that. But I think it's very good from an informational standpoint. And I think as we all start to collect more data, get more data, and companies like the Googles and the Facebook uh, release uh, better algorithms and, and figure out how to crunch that data down, then we can start using them. So 2008, another tool, uh, StatsD. So this came out of uh, Flickr uh, and then eventually got rewritten. Uh, so it was originally in Perl and then got rewritten by the fabulous people at Etsy in Node.js. Uh, which in this case, it's, it's a good application of that language and framework. Um, in that, it's essentially a really simple service that listens for a line protocol, which has this idea of counters and timers. Um, and it will roll them up and flush it on a standard uh, interval to something like a graphite uh, TSDB or OpenTSDB. 
Um, this is pretty cool because it just uses UDP. It's really simple. There's a ton of instrumentation out there for applications. Uh, you can pretty much pick one up, add it to your application and start tracking things like user requests, orders, fail, uh, checkout failures, and it just dumps over UDP to the, your, your StatsD, it rolls it up and fires it off to Graphite, and then you can get some interesting things. What's cool about uh, StatsD is that it also does like percentiles, your min, max, and averages, and automatically computes that for you. It also supports uh, custom sampling times. StatsD is pretty rad, um, I think between uh, Graphite and StatsD, a lot of people are, are kind of standardized on those line protocols. So we're going to go to 2011. Uh, this is when I was dealing with my problems at a company called uh, Sonian, which is actually out of Boston. It was an email archiving business. I mean, is an e email archiving business uh, or e-discovery. Uh, we were operated on four different clouds. Uh, we we're only an operations team of four people. Uh, we had, you know, anywhere between 400 uh, instances in the morning to 2,000 in the evening, depending on when we had to chunk, go through a lot of uh, data. Um, so I used a lot of the tools I previously mentioned, uh, and that explains, you know, the background, where I came from, what I used, my experience trying to monitor these things. And then I basically said, hey, I think I can make my own monitoring tool that's going to be better than these. Which is a question you've got to stop yourself off on often is, uh, do I write another tool? But Sensu was a, originally a weekend project where I took some of the, what I saw in our application development where we used RabbitMQ and a few other things. Uh, basically, we had m message bus architectures that allowed our, our indexing backend to just scale out and in as, as things uh, grew out and contracted, which is pretty rad. Uh, so, Eventually, we replaced a 30 machine Nagios tiered deployment, 30 machines, that was painful, uh, with two instances of Sensu at Sonian. Um, it has a lot of uh, des design decisions that go into it, it allows it to operate well in cloud environments, and I'll get into that. We have released it under the MIT license. Uh, it currently has 300 uh, contributors for the Sensu project as a whole, and that's growing. Uh, it really goes against the idea of a monolith uh, in that its whole point was to be the framework, the core, because as I saw it, I didn't want to solve a time series database problem. I didn't want to solve a alert scheduling problem. I wanted to just solve the collection and handling of data. So the goals originally were to run commands, collect data, uh, provide APIs, something Anagios never had, and create events and handle events. Really simple idea, right? A lot of people uh, out of the gate started referring to it as the monitoring router. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. So again, we, we, I really fell in love with this, this plugin spec, and this also made it really easy to migrate off Nagios, right? We were able to run it in tandem at the same time, compare them both, um, and then move forward. But what's cool about Sensu is it can do a lot more with that standard out. So Sensu has a pipeline where essentially you run checks on your infrastructure. You can fil uh, it'll translate those check results. It'll f you can filter them. You can mutate that data. And then you can pass it off to one or more handlers. This is pretty cool. It allows us to do some really funky stuff. And I'll get more into that. The Sensu plugin project. Um, so because we're using Nagios plugins, we can use over a decade's worth of effort put into the Nagios plugins uh, project. There's also a great project called uh, monitoringplugins.org, I think, uh, that has a great collection. And then the Sensu project itself has its own set. So to install plugins, for example, if I want to monitor my SQL, I run Sensu install p my SQL. It'll install the latest version of the plugin. That's it. We use a GitHub org called Sensu plugins to do our development. We use RubyGems as our, our deployment mechanism uh, behind the scenes, but you don't actually find that out. Just kind of how it works. And then any script you drop into Etsy Sensu plugins will also be added to the path of the Sensu process and be accessible as a plugin. Um, so handlers, Sensu actually supports multiple types of handlers. So pipe, we can execute a command and pass that event data to it via standard input. So again, just like the, the plugin spec, you can just write a script that accepts it. Uh, TCP, 
uh, UDP transport, you can send it back to the Sensu transport for another process to pull it off, and set, we can create groupings of handlers to make it easier to associate them. So in reality, what happens if I define a check and I say, if something goes wrong with a service, I want to be alerted via Slack, PagerDuty, and I want these metrics to go to InfluxDB. So this is what lo it looks like internally in Sensu. And each individual handler can have its own set of filters and mutators. So we can filter events, so we can say, oh, uh, PagerDuty, we only want every three occurrences or every 30 minutes, that sort of thing. Slack, you can uh, do some deduplication on, on that and, and so on. So this is the architecture. The back end is Redis for current state. Uh, RabbitMQ is the transport. So all communication goes through RabbitMQ. So you know, this is what happens when an animated GIF becomes a, a drawn image. <laughs> Uh, so the idea is that you um, uh, target your infrastructure using what's called subscriptions, in this case, web servers. So I want, I want to run my check HTTP on all my web servers. This could also be app one, app two, a load balancer, nginx, MySQL, what have you, and we target that group. Then they individually receive that response and then uh, give uh, either an okay or warning and some output. And then a sensu server will process that, store it in Redis, and that data will become available via the API for things like dashboards or CLI tools or bots. So what allows Sensu to scale essentially out is that because we're using RabbitMQ, we get round robin distribution for free to the back end. So we can add and remove Sensu servers as our infrastructure grows. This is pretty rad. RabbitMQ also gives us proper SSL. It allows us to traverse complex network topologies uh, and gives us uh, access control list so we can uh, limit uh, access to certain uh, exchanges within the message bus. For HA, uh, we don't use load balancers. Uh, you just tell Sensu of one or more brokers within the cluster, and it will round robin uh, amongst them. So JSON configuration. So Sensu uses a JSON config. Uh, what's really neat about this is that Sensu was designed from the get-go to work with config management tools. We didn't want another Nagios config format. We didn't want another markup language, essentially. So we want something that humans can more or less read and write, and machines can easily produce. What's cool about Sensu is that it will glob load from a directory and then deep merge them all. So if your config management tool wants to create a single file and manage it, great. If it likes to do segments and, and snippets, awesome, it can do that too. Actually, and I'll just go back here real quick. You can see in this check definition, it's called MySQL replication. We run this plugin. We target the MySQL machines every 30 seconds. And then you can add custom attributes to this definition. And here I have a playbook to a wiki that says, if this stuff is broken, uh, this is how you fix it. Uh, if not, you're screwed. Uh, but you can add any custom attribute to this. And this becomes available in your event data, which you can use in your notifications, which is fabulous. So one thing I always talk about is Sensu and the config management infrastructure's code workflow. Uh, so here we essentially design what our infrastructure is going to look like. We write some puppet code with some tests. We, in conjunction, write some you know, Terraform or CloudFormation templates or bare metal provisioning code. And then we pump it through maybe a CI. And then that deploys out through our dev staging production. Sensu is really, or any monitoring tool for that matter, and telemetry solution is telling you what the result is of this work, right? You deploy not only your applications, you're deploying infrastructure changes. Uh, so it's your feedback loop as well as your CI. Uh, what's really cool I won't get into is you can actually use your Puppet like server spec code as uh, in production uh, tests with Sensu. There's a plugin that you can run it. So you can say, I expect all these services to run, these ports to be open, and it'll run that uh, and utilize your infrastructure's code tests, which is pretty rad. So this is what Sensu looks like. Um, in, in the wild sort of thing. You have Sensu sitting in the middle uh, with those agents on all those machines. You're slipping up that data. You're uh, providing it to dashboards like Uchiwa so that you can see what things are broken. You're, you can send rich event data off into uh, something like a log stash or gray log or um, if you have the money, no, I'm not going to mention that one. Uh, in FlexDB, uh, so you can send your time series data there. Uh, it's another time series database. Uh, it's newer. Uh, it has an interesting approach to data storage as well as its API and query language. It's pretty dope. And then Grafana, it kind of wins and owns the, the visualization game at this state. 
uh, it does a fantastic job of pulling out influx. And then you can send notifications to things like Slack, PagerDuty, IRC chats. You can also message tools to fire off. People have actually used Sensu as an orchestration tool and done auto remediation, some crazy stuff with it that I never foresaw happening. And I think that really attests to Sensu's uh, idea as a framework and its primitives that it provides. So this is pretty, pretty cool. And I like the ability to taking the idea of best of breed and making it a reality, right? Sensu is kind of the, the core that makes that happen, allows you to do it. So here we are now, and, and what's gonna happen in the future? If this is a future proof slide, by the way, <laughs> there's no dates on this one. Um, so Sensu was designed in 2011. It was designed to work with CM, designed with infrastructure as the way it looked. Now we have containers, and Sensu made the transition into containers okay. Um, it does all right, it does better than most tools in this, these sorts of environments, but it doesn't excel as I'd like it to. So Sensu 2.0 is what we're planning next. Um, Sensu now is growing as a, as a standalone business. Uh, we're building out our team uh, starting next month uh, to develop the next version of Sensu where we're now looking at using Go. We're using uh, distributed consensus for configuration um, and a few other things. So essentially, we're moving role-based access controls, ACLs, the transport, everything into our own uh, standalone binary. Um, that, that's kind of our plan and our direction we're gonna go. Uh, Sensu as today is still gonna be the next-gen monitoring platform, our core of the, these systems for many enterprises for the next five years. And then we're planning essentially transitioning them uh, as they eventually catch up with the curve. So that's the future for Sensu. If you're interested in coming to work uh, with me and on Sensu, and if you know Go, please come talk to me, because uh, that'd be awesome. Um, but in the uh, rest of the ecosystem, there's a few other projects to keep an eye on. Uh, there's a cool tool called Riemann, uh, which is not complex event processing. A lot of people, for some reason, get uh, confused. Essentially takes a stream of data and, and uses uh, closure as the language to describe alerting conditions and, and data persistence, which is pretty cool. Uh, and there's a few other interesting things. Uh, and then uh, InfluxDB has its own tick stack, which you should check out. It's pretty cool and works great with Sensu. And if you combine Sensu and Influx, you get the sick stack. Uh, that's bad. I hope marketing doesn't do that. Um, so thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Porter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at PorterTech. Uh, and I'll be around for the rest of the day. If you want a Sensu shirt, I only have 15 of them of different sizes. Uh, come find me. They're pretty awesome shirts. Uh, I wear one pretty much every day, except today. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Are you allowed to? Yeah, man. I, I, I was standing in the front of the room. I can, I can do anything I want. Um, so one of the uh, hurdles that I ran into uh, when I proposed, um, well, Sinsu as a whole, but uh, to, to management as something that would help us was the lack of a really good cohesive interface. Um, and there is Uchiwa, but I felt like it obviously it had some obvious shortcomings, especially when they, uh, my manager was pushing us to go with a, a commercial offering that had clearly had thousands of man hours put into it. Do you know of any projects on the horizon for improving the user experience? My, my, my own personal motto has been if you're looking at your, your monitoring server in a web browser, you're probably doing it wrong, but I can't convince my manager <laughs> of that. So, Yeah, yeah, I think that, that is a, 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 a usual source of friction. Uh, getting Sensu into the org is that it doesn't provide that standardized, fully all batteries included web UI from the get-go. Um, I think it, it goes back, going back and looking at Sensu, how it wanted to be the, the framework and you plugged in what you wanted, uh, kind of hindered its own growth in that, that regard. 
Uh, and Uchiba, written by Simon out of Montreal, um, he does a great job of making a simple, clean, basic UI. Um, but we, we've acknowledged that this is a, a pain point with Sensu, and that's why as a company we're now gonna actually not have operations folks work on web UIs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we're like we're planning now as growing out our team that we will have proper UI UX people. Um, I am aware of a few other tools that are web UIs for Sensu, uh, but nothing exceeds Uchiwa's functionality. Um, so that's our it's our best option at the time, and we're just excited to finally be able to hire people to build that that sexy interface. Um, one thing though is uh, for visualization, Grafana is pretty hot. Um, you can't beat that. Yes, uh, was, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but service discovery, you did a check there, you said I want to run it on all my SQL servers. How do you do the service discovery? Is it pluggable? Yeah, so it's automatic in that, yeah, I, didn't, I failed to mention that in, when you install a, a Sensu client on a machine, you just install the packet and you tell it where Rabbit is, that's it. When it comes up, it, it sends its first uh, keep alive, and it's like, hey, I'm here, here's some information about me, um, whether it's automatic or you configured that information. Um, and then it adds itself to the registry. Uh, and then any sort of targeting or communication is only done over those subscriptions. Sensu's never like, I want to run this check on this single host. It says, I want to run it on this subscription. Um, although you can have a subscription that's unique to a host. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mine's kind of, mine's kind of a follow up on that. Can the client auto discover? everything on the machine in terms of NFS mounts, services running? So, so f as far as like actual uh, service discovery goes and resource discovery for monitoring, that's all pushed off onto the plugins. So if you were to, for example, do an N NFS, you would rely on the, the NFS plugin, whether it be a Negus or Sensu one, and then it would be like, hey, where's my mounts at? Exclude the ones that match this pattern sort of thing and then monitor them. Yeah. Cool, thank you.